We're back. We appreciate your phone calls, everyone, and we appreciate your patience as we uh, talk with Dr. James Hildreth tonight. Uh, let's get right back to the phones and uh, let's go to Barbara next. Barbara, welcome to Open Line. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Oh, yes. Um, I would like to address this question to Dr. Hildreth. Yes. Um, I'm a patient at uh, Meharry, uh, Meharry Hospital. The, the internal, yes. I go to the internal medicine clinic. Yes, and since this COVID virus has come out, I haven't been able to go to the doctor in like these last three months. And um, Dr. Uh, Calvin Smith, he's my, my uh, uh provider and I was just wondering I get so many calls you know they time I have appointments and I'm just kind of scared about going back to the doctor I mean not the doctor but as far as like going to the hospital because I'm 61 years old and I have both I have some underlying uh problems high blood and uh, diabetes and I'm just wondering would it be safe for me to uh come in and get me a checkup because I haven't been in three months. Okay, let's listen in. Okay, Barbara, uh, you you have every right to be apprehensive about going to the hospitals or the clinics. Many people are feeling that way, but many steps have been taken to make sure that when people come back to the clinics now, that they're gonna be safe. Uh, you know, the waiting rooms now have are spread so that people are not close to each other. Uh, we're taking other steps to make sure that people will be safe, but a lot of people feel that way. And what you can do, what a lot of people are doing, is requesting a telemedicine visit where you don't have to go in to the clinic, but there are some parts of a medical exam that cannot be done uh, by telephone or by, by web. You have to be there. And if you haven't been to see your doctor in three months and you feel like you really need to, I would call them and talk with them, and I think you'd be reassured that a lot of steps have been taken, not just by Meharry, but by all the healthcare institutions in the city to make sure that when people come back now, they're gonna be safe to do that. Uh, we're even screening people who come to the offices to make sure that it's gonna be safe for others to come in terms of temperature and those kinds of things. But what I advise you to do is to call Dr. Smith, who's a really fine physician on our staff, and ask whether or not it'd be appropriate to do a telemedicine or telehealth visit. We've been doing a lot of that for patients who are apprehensive about coming to the clinic. But again, there's some things you have to be physically there uh, to, to do. So I would just call and, re and ask that question. And it may be that a telemedicine visit might be sufficient for what you need. All right, thank you for that answer. Thank you, Barbara, good luck to you. Let's go next to Robert. Hi, Robert, welcome. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I was, I was calling. Uh, you had a program on earlier. My son just tell me about the, about the people ain't got their stimulus checks yet. Okay. And I was trying to figure out why. They, every time I go in RS, uh, you know, a website why it says based on the information we have, we need more information. And they, they mm -hmm. supposed to get all the information in Social Security, and Social Security's got all my information, address, mm -hmm. and Social Security number, and bank account number. Mm -hmm. I can't understand why they have got them on disability. Robert, I tell you what, let, let me put you on hold and have our producer and director Taylor uh, get your information and maybe we can have someone uh, look into that for you and, and call you back. Hold on just a moment now. Just there you go, because that is not our line of expertise tonight, but we do want to help you out. Let's mm -hmm. go to George next on line four. Hi, George. George, you there? <clears throat> Sure. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Go you ahead. hear me? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I wanted to ask him uh, what he thinks about. Uh, uh, I've, I've been reading on the internet and listening <clears throat> on, uh, to Dr. Oz on television. Yeah. He says these air hand dryers that in, in the bathrooms and the uh, uh, commodes, when you flush the commode, if you don't put that lid down on the commode, it just spreads the virus throughout the mm. bathroom, and the hand air dryers are spreading that virus in the bathroom. Do you think the bathroom is the most dangerous place there is in a restaurant and schools and um, public buildings 
that people can catch this virus from. Okay, let's listen in. Uh, George, uh, generally speaking, uh, water closets, toilets tend to be places where uh, unless there's proper sanitation, there is a high risk of not just viruses, but bacteria. There's something called, there's some forms of bacteria that when you flush the commode, it's true, they can become aerosolized and get into the air. We don't know that for sure for uh, this virus. We don't even know if the virus is in urine or our stool, to be, to, to be honest with you. We know there's nucleic acid present, but we don't know if that's virus or not. But, but the bottom line is that for all those reasons, if you do what we've been talking about before, which is to wash your hands, mm -hmm. whether you're going to a toilet or going to a store or go wherever you go, that's why washing the hands is so very important because those in toilets, especially public toilets, those are what we call high touch surfaces where many people are using the same doorknobs, the same, I don't know, handles and all this. Uh, because we can't be sure they're gonna be sanitized appropriately, either by wearing gloves or by washing our hands frequently, we can account for that. But it's certainly true that in, in toilets, water closet, places like that, they do tend to be a place where there are a lot of germs present. And I think what is happening now with a lot of organizations, rather than having those places clean once a day, they're being cleaned many, many times a day for that very reason. Uh, but it is true that when you flush the toilet, you can create microbes that, that get into the air mm -hmm. Whether or not that's true for COVID-19, we're not sure, but it's certainly true for some bacteria. Just an extra step of precaution to take there. George, thank you for the call. Up next, we have uh, Lisa on line five. Hi, Lisa, welcome to Open Line. Hi. Hey there, just turn your TV set down, okay? And I'll remind all our callers on hold when we uh, just listen over the phone and there's a little bit of a delay there. Go ahead and turn your TV down and go ahead with your question, Lisa. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Hildreth. Thanks for taking my question. My concern, and I guess question also, is that with the COVID-19 virus being similar to malaria, as with the H1N1 outbreak, should we be concerned with mosquitoes spreading the virus? Uh, as far as we know, there is no evidence that mosquitoes can transmit COVID-19. What you're referring to is that malaria is a parasite and mosquitoes are the vector. Vectors are those things that allow viruses to go from one, uh, one animal or one person to another. In the case of COVID-19, we are the vector. We're spreading the virus to each other. Right. But in the case of malaria, mosquito is the vector because it's carrying the malaria parasite from one person to another in the blood that it sucks out of our, our bodies. But as far as I know, there's no evidence yet right. that I'm aware of that COVID-19 can be spread through mosquito bites. And maybe and the, there's certain the, the mal Go ahead, sorry, sorry. sorry, doctor, maybe the malaria question came up because of the drug hydroxychloroquine. Uh, exactly. There's a connection there and people hear malaria, right? Right, exactly. But but I can, I can tell you uh, all the publicity notwithstanding there's currently no solid evidence that hydrochloroquine is an effective treatment or preventative for right. COVID-19. All right, thank you, Lisa, for that call. Up next, let's go to, oh, hold on just a second. Resume that and end it. All right, up next we've got Ann. Hi, Ann, welcome. Yes, hi. This past weekend, my family and I traveled to just this side of Jackson, Tennessee. And I was <clears throat> appalled at the fact that from the time we left Davidson County until the time we got back into Davidson County, we encountered no one um, that was wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no one. From the attendance at a gas station to the state park attendance and the visitors uh, no one and so i know that i'm safe and you're doing everything here in davidson county that needs to be done but what are you and the mayor doing to monitor what's going on around this because i can assure you 
that some of these counties have low numbers and they haven't had the amount of testing done and they are living their lives as though nothing is going on. Right, right. And masks are not being worn and this is being spread. And it concerns me because we cannot live in a bubble forever. And I'm 63, I've lived with lupus since I was 30 and I, don't want to live in an insular bubble right. for the rest of my life. Well, you have you have mm-hmm. valid concerns given that you have. Uh you said you had lupus since you were 30, in your 30s? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's listen into what Dr. Hilder says. So I think you point out one of the greatest challenges that we have in public health right now, really across the whole country, is that there are so many people who, for whatever reason, uh, have chosen not to adhere to the advice uh, that scientists and public health officials are giving. Uh, One of the things that we know for sure is that viruses do not respect borders, city borders, county borders, state borders, even continental borders. So, you know, Nashville might do a great job of controlling the virus, but we have no say over what happens in our neighboring counties. So to the extent that we do a great job and some of those don't, you're absolutely right. Uh, It could mean that all the hard work that we do could be undone by having the virus brought into Nashville uh, by others. But honestly, uh, I think the mayor and Dr. Jahangir and Dr. Caldwell as kind of leaders of this effort have done a great job, uh, I think, of here in Nashville, because when I go out now, I'm pleased to see most people are wearing a mask. uh, When I go into the store, as I said before, you now see the plexiglass separating you and the checkout clerk. But, but you point out a major, major challenge that we have, which is that there's so, un- so much unevenness in how people are reacting to the virus. Some are taking it seriously, some are not. But the truth is that by protecting ourselves, we protect each other. And to me, if we care about each other, and we really do care about each other, it's a sign of respect. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we were asking. And so I, I don't know what else to say, except that it's a, it's a yeah. major challenge. You're Okay, with that, we're going to take another break, and we've got a few more calls right after this. Stay with us.